Hello and welcome to the Main Street Matters webinar. My name is Patrick Kaiser. I am the executive director of Heart on Main Street. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping independent retailers uh, by providing resources and tools to be able to help you thrive within your local communities. This is a monthly webinar series. Actually, we've been doing a little bit more than monthly recently, but uh, we really aim to provide great education for you so you can reinvest back into your businesses and help you grow as, as a retailer. Our, our guest today is Dane Cohen, uh, the Director of Sales and Business Development uh, for Management One. Management One is a leading inventory management financial planning company really specializing in working with independent retailers and to provide training and support and accountability to help create financial stability for you all. Uh, so, Dane, thank you so much for joining today. Hey, Patrick. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be with you in the community. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited that you're here. So... Uh, today, we're going to be talking about achieving financial freedom, kind of broadly. Uh, there's a lot involved in that, uh, budgeting, financial planning, open to buys, um, a lot going into that. So kind of really a roadmap to helping you achieve more of a financial stability in uh, in these times. Uh, Dane, you know, I don't know about where you are, but where I am, the weather is changing, the leaves are turning colors. So that means really one thing, budgeting for next year and <laughs> exactly that's the only thing that it means right um but so how can we really achieve our, our financial freedom as we're going into into 2024 yeah so i and i'm gonna get my screen up here in in, in a moment uh but i listen i love that the the, the way of framing this right financial freedom yeah. and, and really here's why there are some basic rules of retail from a financial math perspective. And success is actually really easy to calculate on paper. Not saying it's easily easy to achieve, sure. but it's easy to calculate on paper. What you need to do in sales, what you need to hit in margin, these are really firm numbers that we can know, right? And what it takes to be profitable. And if we miss those goals, how that's going to set you back. So the key to financial freedom is one, level setting those goals, right? And working yeah. from a place of knowledge and a place of knowledge is a place of power. So you're never going to achieve financial freedom if we don't know at the very start, what do I need to do in sales to cover my basic expensive to keep the lights yeah. on? Um, so in this presentation today, and we call it the roadmap to making money in today's retail climate because we know it's a it's a climate. It's right? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it is changing every year. So changing every year, every month it could, it, it seems so uh um you know things seem to be moving so fast, but you know there are some old we're going to talk a little old school retail, a little tried and true principles and how we can really frame our business minds to be geared up for profit and cash okay. flow, right? The, this is because really, and, and when you talk about your organization and, and what you're doing, you know, it, it's kind of the, we need to put the oxygen masks on ourselves so that we can be thriving successful business and then we can start taking care of everyone else, right? So yes. the first thing is we need to have a sense of financial stability and confidence in our business. And then we can do all those incredible things and you know, be involved in the organizations and the charities and the uh, giving back to the community that we want because we have a sense of financial freedom and independence as a business owner ourselves. So we'll go over some of that. I'm going to try to share my screen. Are we ready to go? Let's do it. All right. All right. All right. Boom. We can see it. Can we see this? Yes, I can see you right. Hi. Okay, great. <laughs> I just like to make sure because I like to take uh, some notes. So we have 45 minutes and uh, we have a lot to get through. So I'm going to jump right in and we are going to start by talking about the state of the current retail economy. And I just want to go over some very high level numbers right now. Okay. So first, 
Let's look at gross domestic product in Q2. Now we're talking Q2 numbers. I'm going to explain to you why this is going to impact your business. I promise I will make a point here. So just stay with me. So did gross domestic product GDP, which is the main indicator of the economic health, did it rise or fall? And we're talking Q2 of 2023. Well, it was up 2.4% and that's adjusted for inflation. Okay, so that's a great sign. Did consumer spending increase? Well, yep, it did. 1.6% in Q2. And I kid you not, it was fueled by services. And a lot of economists say that Taylor Swift and Beyonce tickets were Jeez. a huge factor in economic growth in that 1.6%. So, so we need more tour. We need more to, to really increase that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Just have her keep touring all year round, every <laughs> year. But why that's so important, right? There is money out there and people are willing to spend in the places that mean something to them, right? So people love Taylor Swift, all of a sudden they have money for those tickets. So just, just like Taylor, we gotta think like Taylor, create a product that people want, a brand, a retail store, uh, deliver the goods and people are willing to pay. So there's money out there in the economy. Uh, did personal income rise or fall? Well, personal income was up two and a half percent, and that's after taxes and adjusted for inflation. So people have more money in their pocket. And I know that's counterintuitive to how we feel, perhaps, but the numbers do not lie. Finally, inflation. Well, did inflation rise, right? That's the big concern out there. It did. It did. It was up 2.6 percent, but that is the lowest it's trended since uh, the pandemic. So it is now trending downwards. It was up to 4.1% at the beginning of the year. It's now bumped down to 2.6%. And it's looking to trend down once the Q3 reports are released Good. as well. So it did increase. It's still rising, right. but at, it's down trending at a slower pace. And then finally, we're looking at the last report from that quarter, June retail sales. Well, they were pretty flat, but we eked out an increase of 0.2%. And that was driven by women's clothing stores, shoe stores, and department stores. Okay. So now we've seen May, June, both increases a little bit flat, but again, there is strength in the economy. So I'm going to tell everyone a little term that's been floating around with the economist, and it's called the vibe session. The vibe session, kind of a funky term. What is that? Right? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a fun, that's a fun term. Yeah. It's a fun term. It's a vibe session. So, what does that mean? Well, quite literally, it means that economic indicators are actually all good, right? Our GDP, inflation is downtrending, personal income is up, retail sales are increasing or flat. But yet there's still just a general vibe out there that the economy's not doing well. There's a little anxiety, there's some fear. And the vibe session was coined really to kind of match those two sentiments where we have economic indicators and, and the really the reports out there saying, hey, everything's looking good, but the general public and the consumers just don't feel the right vibe on the economy right now. And that can have very real consequences, right? This isn't just a perceived thing. If people don't feel good about the economy, it's going to impact how they spend, how they save, how they approach things, the buying decisions they make. So this vibe session could become a very real recession based on kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So Is that because of the last several quarters before that, you know, and some trepidation there that people are just kind of maybe weary of something happening in the future, or do they kind of know why why the vibes are off? The main the main reason is is because bread and milk the price of bread and milk is increasing, right? Okay. So every time you go to the grocery store, you know I could give you seven hundred facts of why the economy is good, but if you're checking out at the grocery store and your bill is bigger than you're used to it being, it just creates a very uh, it, it's very hard to get over that feeling yeah. that things are in a bad state. So inflation has really real effects. 
uh, it really uh, forces people to think about their wallet, their pocketbook at all times, because sure. every place they go, they're seeing rising costs. You go to dinner with friends, you see the bill come, you know that that's more expensive than it was three years ago, right? So you're confronted with thinking about the economy on a day-to-day -day base basis. The other thing is the house the, is is really housing right yep. now. So you know those interest rates are are really something that people are are worried about, and I think that's creating a lot of these bad vibes as well. Um, so let's look at the facts, though. We took a survey of our retailers, and why this is important is I could give you all the economic data that I can give you, but that doesn't represent Main Street. Right. The, the, you know, that's right. looking at these big forces in the economy and it feels so distant. So this hopefully is a little bit more uh, representative of what's actually happening in independent retail, because we at Management One, we work with all independent retailers. So when we look at sales right here, we're looking at sales across across the independent retail community. And we work with about 1,100 retail locations. So here we see we're going 12 months back. Uh, we started with this, you know, very strong increase of 5.1% in September 22, 22 over LY. We started out 2023, look at this number from January, 8.9% up across our retail stores, that's a huge increase over 2022, which was already a banner year of right. sales, right? So we're actually seeing increases on a huge uh, bump in sales post pandemic. And now, you know, we're seeing things level out a little bit, you know, and coming a little bit back down to reality. So you see in April, we were flat. Coming into August, 2023, last report, uh, which showed us up 2.3%. But again, we have to look at this as the po uh, positive. 2022 was the biggest, one of the biggest years that retail has ever had. Uh, and 2021 and 2022 combined were massive, massive years of business. So if we're seeing us comping those numbers or even doing above, there is health in the retail economy. And I want to make this very clear why I'm sharing this with everyone. The reason is, is I want people to know that there is space for great business to be had by great retailers right now. And if we come from a place of fear, both in our buying and our business decisions, most likely we're going to end up with that type of result. If we buy sheepishly, if we hold on too tight, if we don't make great data-driven decisions, we could really have that self-fulfilling vibe session um, approach where we're actually digging our own hole because we're so scared of the economy that doesn't really even exist on paper. And, you know, sorry, with, with that, you had said earlier that there was a 0.2% growth in at those Q2 uh, that was showing in June, that was showing a, at independent retail, a 2.3% growth. So, um, you know, overall, Main Street doing better than all of independent, uh, all in, sorry, all retail in general. So in, in, in fact, independent retail is actually seeing the most growth out of e-commerce right now, where the majors are starting to see a decrease from pandemic levels. So there's a actually a rise in the opportunity right now for independent retailers, where kind of those big bubbles of sales that were happening in the Amazons and the um, targets and you know all the kind of big box stores, they're seeing a leveling out and a decrease in their e-commerce sales when there's market share to be gained for independent retailers. Very cool. Um, okay, so a little more facts for you. Uh, this year, back to school sales hit 12 billion in clothing and accessories and 7.8 billion in shoes. That's the highest on record in the past decade. Okay, so just some more indicators of 
what's really happening in the economy. So is this vibe session over? Are we ready to say kind of goodbye to the vibe session? Uh, again, annual retail sales are scheduled to continue to grow in a cumulative of four to six percent. Store openings outpaced closings in 2022 for the first time since the pandemic. On run retail sales, like we just said, are growing for small and medium-sized retailers. And back to school spending reached record highs. So I don't want to ignore the real challenges in the economy. Student debt repayments have started again in the beginning of October. People are very worried and confused about that. Inflation is very real and costly. And the housing market is in a little bit of crisis right now, which is leading to consumer um, consumer fear and, and instability in the market. So there are real, real challenges. But again, if we've learned anything from Taylor Swift, when the product is good, people will buy it. So let's talk about what this looks like for you and your business. Let's take this to a practical sense of what we can do when we want to talk about financial freedom, when we want to talk about retail success, we always want to look at it in the simplest terms. And that is, how much cash can I make from this business? And I don't mean that in a gross sense. I mean that in a, literally, how can I create a cash flow positive business, right? Uh, because there are a lot of factors of success in retail, but the number one factor for an independent retailer is over the course of the year, can I keep cash flow positive and I can, can I continue to generate cash while investing in inventory at the same time? So here are the four areas that we're going to cover. We're going to rethink margin. This is super important and it's going to be super interesting when I lay this out for you about how to think about margin. We are so, a lot of retailers are so caught up on margin, but there are other ways to think about what success looks like in a retail business. Playing offense, okay? This goes back to that vibe session mentality. We don't want to be on the defensive and cowering to what we think is happening. We want to play offense and look at our data and make decisions that are going to be aggressive in the areas that we are seeing success and build on that success. Sharpening pricing. This is so important and so overlooked as a tool for retailers. And I'm gonna show you how it's really just bottom line dollars. And then finally, embracing markdowns. Say it with me, embrace Ooh. markdowns. A little scary there. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a big one because we view it as an enemy sometimes. And we're gonna see, are markdowns an enemy or could they be a friend? So we're going to go through these topics and hopefully we'll learn some lessons and then we'll open it up to questions. So cash flow, okay? This to management one is the biggest really indicator of a retail business being successful or a retail business having hard times. It's your ability to generate cash in the business. 52%, I'm going to throw this number up there because that's a a majority right there, 52%. What am I talking about? 52% is the average cost of purchases for a retailer. So let me put that in the simplest terms. That means that of all the cash that you generate in your business, 52% of that goes right back into inventory. That's it. Half of your money yep. plus a little more just goes right back into inventory. So when we talk about financial freedom and success in retail, it's all rooted in your inventory. It's all there. Your ability to invest correctly is, is crucial to how you're going to perform. So let's talk about, I just talked to you about cost of purchases. Let's talk about cost of goods sold. Okay, we all know that cost of goods sold is literally the backbone of gross profit. That's how you calculate gross profit. Uh, and if anyone kind of has questions about that, I'm happy to talk, talk through that. But we get to our gross profit margin by understanding our cost of goods sold. It is the most misleading term in all of retail. 
Here's why. It is literally just calculating the cost of the goods that you sold. It doesn't take into account all the other stuff sitting on your floor that may or may not be selling. And let's look at what this looks like from an accountant perspective. Okay, so we're going to do a little math. I know we're going to feel like we're in an Ecom 101 class. I hope to not be too dry, so stay with me. Cost of goods sold is literally calculated by this simple formula right here. Okay, so your accountant would look, okay, Jane's dress shop started the year with $250,000 worth of inventory. They purchased over the course of the year $700,000 worth of goods, and they ended the year with $350,000 in inventory. Your cost of goods is quite simply $600,000. That is this big term in account, retail accounting that everyone lives or dies by. So our sales, okay, right up here. Great job. This retailer did a million dollars in sales. That's awesome. And if we take the sales and subtract out the cost of goods, we're left with your gross profit, $400,000 in gross profit. Hey, woo. Great year. Okay. And then we have our expenses. We have rent, we have payroll, we have electric bills, we have utility bills, uh, marketing costs. So all of our expenses totaled $350,000. So you get on the phone with your accountant at the end of the year, and he says, James Dress Shop, great job. You generated $50,000 in net profit. Woo -woo -woo. Okay, great. We did it. Let's see what your bank account sees though. Okay. Same exact numbers, same exact business. Okay. Well, it's really simple. We just told you that Jane's Dress Shop purchased 700000 in clothes and then had 350000 ex in expenses. The money that came out of the business that year was $1,050,000, and we only did a million in sales. So your accountant is telling you you made a net profit of $50,000, but your bank account tells you you lost $50,000. You're in the red $50,000. How could that be? And this is why the accountant is looking at all of your old merchandise as an as a asset. They're looking at it as an asset. Everything you have on your floor is an asset. Management one looks at it. The time that that merchandise hits your floor, it's already a ticking liability, right? Yep. If you're in a fashion business, if you're in a home goods business and accessories business, you know you have a window to sell these goods. If you're getting in, in um, you know, if you got in some fall great sweaters in August and we're still sitting with them in October, those sweaters, the, the countdown has begun to when they're going to go out of season or potentially out of style, right? So we're looking at it from the, the simplest of terms, which is, What's your cash in versus cash out position? What did you sell at retail minus what you received at cost? And that's your cash margin. And it really is that simple, although getting there is very complex. The formula is simple, but how we get to that cash margin positivity is a little complex. So let's talk about how we can ensure that we don't fall into that first trap where we're making margin but our bank account is, I can't even pay for the goods because I have no money in my bank account. We've all been there, me included. So we have to start thinking of ourselves not as buyers, but yeah. you are investment brokers. Every piece of merchandise you purchase is an investment that has to have an ROI. It has to have a return. You know, just like when you purchase a piece of real estate, you're hoping it appreciates, right? We don't have that luxury. We're more like buying a car. It depreciates the minute you step foot in the car and put your, your foot on the gas. Retail uh, merchandise depreciates once it gets into the store. So we want to view value and ROI in a little bit different of a way. Love that. Because I mean, you are not physically buying it, right? A buyer implies that you are buying it. You are investing in this so that somebody else can buy it. Um, that I, I love that. I've talked with many salespeople and retailers that know that that's a wrong term that, as a buyer. You're you're an investor. You're it, couldn't exactly. And I love that. Um, so 
when we think about that return on investment, right, that you're talking about, we have to think about it not just in dollars, but in two ways, your stock to sales ratio and your turn. Okay, I didn't write it in there, so I'm writing it in now. But your <laughs> turn, okay? So what your accountant isn't taking it, uh, into a, account, your accountant taking into account, is the time and the value of the merchandise. So let's first talk about stock to sales ratio, because I firmly believe that these two numbers are way more important than margin in your business. Let's talk about stock to sales ratio, okay? So in simplest terms, here's the best way that I like to communicate stock to sales ratio. Well, it literally is just how much goods do you need in comparison to the sales that you want to do? So if you want to sell $100 worth of dresses, how many dresses do you need in order to set in, on your floor in order to sell that $100? Well, the answer is you need $100 worth of dresses to sell $100, but we all know we need to give some selection, we need to give some cushion so that we don't sell out. So maybe you need $200 to sell that $100. Think about it like this. You have company coming over and you and your spouse are arguing about how many sandwiches you need for the for your company. You have 20 people coming over and you turn to your spouse and you say, honey, I think we need 20 sandwiches for 20 people. And they say, no way, we need 35 sandwiches. Are you nuts? How are we going to give 20 sandwiches? What if someone doesn't like one of them? What happens if we need 35 sandwiches, right? Yeah. And so two things are going to happen. If you order 20 sandwiches, people are going to come to your house and go, I couldn't find what I wanted. There wasn't enough selection. I'm hungry and I'm walking out unhappy. And we're going to talk about it in the group chat later. Okay. That's option one. Option two is you go and you buy 40 sandwiches and you have so much leftovers, you put it in the fridge, your whole fridge is taken up by leftovers. They go bad because no one eats it. No one in the family wants the sandwich. You're eating it for breakfast, you're eating it for lunch, you're eating it for dinner. And you're like, get these rotting sandwiches out and you end up throwing them out and now you've wasted money. And so both situations are potentially bad, right? And that's an over overstocked or understocked situation. That's your stock to sales ratio. It's a really interesting way of thinking about it, right? What is the Goldilocks of inventory that I need? And buying to that amount is going to be so crucial to your success, right? Because we won't need to buy enough that we are satisfying the customer's needs, but not too much where we're just going to have wild overages and then end up having to clearance out those goods. And then turn is a simple time calculation. How quickly can I sell these goods, right? What is the appropriate turn rate? So turn is how many times you're going to flip your inventory in a year. So for a women's fashion boutique, that could be five to six times a year. Basically, we want to know, I want to get it in, I want to sell it, and then when I get new product, to back it up and keep on that kind of flow of goods. It's turn is the time, it's the flow, it's how long it's gonna take to sell through things because you don't want something sitting on your floor for a year, right? We want it to move through the business to keep generating cash. The more time it turns, the more cash you're generating in and out of the business. So these terms are almost more significant than margin, in my opinion, they just are. Okay. So these are the things we need to be thinking about. Do I have too much? Do I have too little? Am I efficiently rotating through my merchandise? Because last year's sales only tell a small piece of the puzzle. So the key here is we want to stop winging it. Okay. When we go to market, when we make our purchases, and I go back to that original statement I made that there are formulas for this. There are ways to know what the right stock level is. There are ways to know how much you should be buying at market and what sales you should be doing. So winging it is no longer an option if you really want to achieve that financial freedom. When you wing it, you end up with what's called a wide and thin merchandising strategy. When you have a whole lot of everything, but a whole lot of nothing. 
a little bit of everything, but a whole lot of nothing. And so what does that look like? You're going, you're buying. I want to buy a little of this. I want to buy a little of this. This is going to make this customer happy. This is going to make this customer happy. And you're dabbling into all different places, but you're not making a real statement. So it's a whole lot of nothing and a little bit of everything. You know, we, we have this mentality as retailers that we have to give our customers as big of a selection as possible. But what really ends up happening is you're giving what is called the paradox of choice. When you put too much stuff in front of your customer, you paralyze them. You literally paralyze them in, from decision making. It's like when you go to an ice cream shop and the line is long and there's 72 flavors sitting in front of you and you get up there and you panic and you go vanilla, yeah. right? Go with whatever, even though there's yeah 70 different flavors for you to choose from. You're just, uh, 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 yeah, what, uh, tried and true. And there are so many times where you could walk into a retail store and there's just there's 700 dresses and there's 30 t-shirts and it's like, I, I can't make a decision. So buying with a budget is so important. We want to get a good category structure. We're going to talk about that. We want to forecast your sales, have a real prediction of what you think you can do in the year ahead. We want to factor in markdowns and set beginning and ending inventory. That right there is the foundation of open to buy planning, right? These four steps are really the foundation to how you can start planning budgets for market. And so this is so crucial. And, you know, Patrick, I'm happy to talk with anyone that wants some more information on this, but this is really the foundation here. Yep. So let's talk about up. your, you know, some are already happening and markets are coming up. I mean, January, but some are already happening throughout the fall. And so having that good understanding before you attend, I mean, it is so crucial. Half exactly. exactly. So let's talk about your department class subclass, right? This is the foundation DCS, how most retail stores are categorized. And we really want to be smart about this. So if you're a women's fashion boutique, we may want to have apparel. We may want to have outerwear, but outerwear may not be enough. We may need to differentiate between winter coats and a spring jacket. A denim jacket does not behave like a winter jacket. And we need to acknowledge that in how we label our goods. Pants, a pair of athletic leggings do not behave the same as a pair of dress trousers. They are different. They are different businesses within your store. T-shirts, even something as simple as a graphic tee versus a basic tee don't match up. I'm wearing a nice, you know, kind of blazer right now. If I walk into a store and say, hey, I'm looking for a t-shirt to go under a blazer, I need a basic tee, and all they have is sports t-shirts, it's not going to right. cut it. So looking at these things and drilling down into your class structure, making sure everything is labeled correctly in your system is the foundation for a lot of these decisions. And so instead of playing wide and thin, right, which is that little bit of everything, whole lot of nothing, we want to play offense. So this brings us to our next topic, playing offense in your buying. We want to play offense by making data-driven decisions, not decisions based on the vibe of the economy, not decisions based on what you think or what, you, what your gut tells you, but how do I make some aggressive decisions in the categories that are performing well? And that's a great example of basic versus graphic tees. If my customer is demanding graphic tees and I'm seeing it in the sales, I need to know how to track that. And then maybe that's where I put my budget. So instead of going out and buying $5,000 of basic tees and $5,000 of graphic tees, aggressive plans in the categories that are succeeding, maybe you put $8,000 towards graphic tees and set aside a $2,000 budget for basic tees. Data is financial freedom. Not only that, when you plan better and make better buying decisions, you become more important to your vendors. So instead of walking into a vendor booth and going, okay, I'll take one size run of that and one size run of that, thank you very much, you're not that important to them. When it comes to reorders, you're not that important to them. When they have to cancel goods, you will be the person they cancel good from. So buying with conviction is super important. It also 
keeps your customer focused. So instead of getting to that 72 flavors, when you walk up to the counter, you're focusing them and you're saying our best selling flavor is banana crunch. That's a weird flavor. I don't hey, think hey, I like it's that, all right. But... It, it's your best selling flavor. It's, yeah. It yeah. Or chocolate chip cookie dough fudge monster. That's the best flavor. You're focusing the customer. Right. And you have to think of yourselves as the original influencer, the original trendsetter. And it helps you actually avoid excessive markdowns. Counterintuitive, the more aggressive you buy on what you think is going to do well, the less markdowns you're going to take. Because if something doesn't work, you can chop it off at the leg and get rid of it, right? You don't have to let it drag you down when you have a little bit of kind of sized out mess all over your store. You can make definitive decisions if something works or doesn't work. Keeping it fresh. This is turn, right? So when we talk about turn, we're talking about that continuous flipping of merchandise. Here's some really interesting facts for you. 90% of your sales on average will come from merchandise that's less than 10 weeks old. That's the window. A majority, a, a, a vast majority of your business is coming from new goods. In most businesses, 50% of your sales will come from goods that landed within the same month. So having a fresh flow of goods is so important. And let's look at what the flow of a retail store should look like. At the beginning of the season, you want to avoid front loading everything, right? A lot of people make that mistake where they just bring in everything they can as early as they can. We're getting ready for spring, for fall season. Let's land it all in August and get everything we can at once. And then October comes around and you're left with scraps. So we want to avoid front loading and instead continue to flow in new goods to the peak of the season. Once we hit peak season, then we want to start thinking. And by the way, now would be that time in the fall season, right? We're already there. What could I start marking down? What did I get in August that just hasn't sold well? The sell-through isn't there. And we want to start planning our markdowns. And then by the time we know it, we're off to the next season. So this is a cycle, this inventory cycle. It's, we, we, we know what's happening and what's tied up in this whole thing. Cash, it's all your cash flowing in and out of the business. That was not a good way of writing this, but this, Sorry. <laughs> this looks like a, a serial killer did this, but it is cash. This is your cash, this flow of goods in and out, this careful, meticulous way that we need to buy is going to protect your cash. And, you know, I love because it's often so often you hear, you know, what's new or the looking for what's new. And in doing that, you know, that 90% is going to be in the first 10 weeks, the 50% in the first month. But if you can kind of extend out what's new, it's, well, it's been in our back, but it's new to you. Um, you're extending that season. You're getting things that people haven't seen before, getting that out on the floor. I love that. Yeah. And so I'm going to try to go through pricing and markdowns pretty quickly because I know it's too 40 p.m. Eastern time here, um, but we, I know we're getting through a lot. Uh, so, so we we kind of hit um, now. Pricing and markdowns are so related because they're two sides of the same coin, right? Um, pricing is basically how much am I marking something up, and markdowns are how much am I marking it down when it doesn't sell. So they're completely related. Okay, your your the price you set something at is completely related to if and when you're going to have to mark it down. So first off, let's talk about how to increase prices and why to increase prices. Okay. Number one, inflation, inflation, inflation. Prices are going up everywhere. If you're not increasing your prices to some level, you're being left behind. You're losing money. Yeah. Thank you. Any dollar increase. If, if today I look at this candle, Okay. And I was selling it on my floor for $15. And tomorrow I sell it for $16. I changed the price $16. That $1 is pure profit. It is nothing else but bottom line profit just goes right to your bottom line. So if you go in your store right now and say, what can I mark up a dollar or two? That's just going right back into your bottom line really important to think about. It's, the, it's really one of the only ways in retail to make money for free. 
Okay. And I hear a lot of complaints. Oh, I can't raise my prices. My vendor set the price. I just, I do keystone markup. I double the wholesale price. You know, it's too much math. I just double and, and kind of add a dollar or two. Well, let me show you what this means for your business. Okay. We kind of have cash goals that we set with our clients. And in order to hit those cash margin goals, if you mark something up at a 50% IMU, which means essentially you bought it at retail for $20 and you sell it for $40, you have to set sell through 96% of that product at full price, full price in order to make your cash back. Okay. Now let's look at 60%. So instead I buy that dress for $20 in the market and I sell it for $50. That's only $10 increase, okay? But now I only need to sell through 70% at full price to make my cash back. So the way that you have to think about pricing is it's not just those bottom line dollars, but you better be super sure that you can sell through something at 96% if you want to market at 50% markup and just a keystone, you know, doubling the retail, uh, whole, the wholesale cost. Right. So there are real implications to how you price. I was I'm talking give with the retailer. Sorry. I, I know we're, but I was talking with the retailer who said, you know, Keystone is Tombstone. Um, I'm not going to be able to sell through 96% of everything that I bought. And that's going to sink me if I'm only doubling the price, if I'm only selling it that. Um, that's that's going to be the death. So I, I've always had that in my mind. Yeah. Keystone is, is tomb, Tombstone. You have to do more than that. I, I love that. And I'm going to give you a great example, a quick little anecdote. Uh, these sunglasses, we uh, we actually worked with this company and helped them with some pricing. And I happen to have known that these sunglasses, it's a great new sunglass brand, a little bit expensive. They sell for $140. That was the price. I was in a retail store this summer, a small new store in a beach town I was vacationing at, and they were sitting there for $118. And I said, hey, I, I'm I'm a curious person. I'm working retail. I said, is the owner here? I'd love to just, you know, congratulate him on the new store, ask him about his business. The guy said, I'm the owner. I'm here today. I'm I'm helping around the store. I said, can I ask you why you price these at 118? They're selling everywhere else for 140. He goes, Oh, I didn't know that. I just doubled the and my heart just went. Oh, Keystone is Tombstone. I love that, Patrick. I'm going to hey, use that. Steal it. I stole it. So you can have it too. And I looked at him. I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, I, you know, it's easy for me and they're selling. And I said to him, yes, of course they're selling because you're undervaluing your goods. We have to start thinking of pricing as not as what the wholesale cost tells us, but what is the value to my customer? Are those are those glasses going to sell for 118 or would someone buy them for 145 or 140, which is the re regular price anyways. So it is possible to get more markup and we're going to send this presentation out in recording. So here is the formula for markup. I will help you solve this formula, uh, but it's a great one to have. You could look up IMU formula and there's a lot of great, great calculators out there if you're looking for help with this. So, we want to actually set your markup target. We want to steer clear of just pricing off the wholesale price and instead price off the value. And we want to look for where we can start inching up the price. What areas of our business? And lastly, markdowns, okay? Are they a friend or a foe? Well, I'm going to give you the cheat sheet. They are your friend. Markdowns are your friend. It's a cost of doing business. And don't get me wrong. It's a real cost. There is a real tangible cost to markdowns, but it is going to one, create artificial demand for product. If this candle has not sold for $20 and it has sat there and sat there and sat there, and I have put it uh, out on social media, great new candle, new candle for holiday, come buy it. If I have put it in the front of the store, I put it at the register, I've done everything that I can to create demand. 
My last stop on the train is I mark it down to $10. I take 50% off and that is creating artificial demand. So it's the last stop on the demand train. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. I haven't been able to sell it any other way. I've trained my employees on it. I've given my customers knowledge on it. And this is my last stop to create artificial demand. And then- Dean, you got a quick question. What does IMU uh, and MMU stand for? Okay, so IMU is your initial markup. So that is, I buy something at a trade show for ten dollars. I buy this can, you know, I buy this candle for ten dollars. The initial markup is, I sell it in my store for twenty dollars. My initial markup was ten dollars. So that's your initial markup. My maintained markup, my MMU is, okay, well, I sold 10 of these at full price. I had to mark down some of them. What the maintained markup is, is the margin that it actually equaled out to when I, co when I combine those all together. So your initial markup is basically your ceiling of profit, right? You can't go higher than that. It's only going to come down. The maintained markup is how much did it come down after you factor in markdowns? Maybe you sold it all at full price, but if you took any markdowns, we have to factor that in to get your maintained markup. Fantastic question. Thank Shannon. Thank you. Okay. And so this is my favorite graphic on markdowns. We need to cut the dead weight or we'll sink. No, we spent a lot of money on that dead weight. Merchandise that isn't selling in your store is dead weight. It's dust on a shelf. It's your cash collecting dust in your store. Now, I'm not saying be willy nilly with markdowns, but I am saying there comes a time where we have to let go because the customer is voting with their wallet and they are voting no on this merchandise. So markdowns are a tool to generate inventory health. Here's my five rules for markdowns. Oh, we're going the wrong way. One, plan them. You should actually have a number in your head that you're accounting for. Hey, you know what? This year, I think 15% of my sales are going to come from markdowns. That's healthy. That's healthy. We want to plan for it and have a realistic number so we can set that initial markup and then our maintained markup goals. Mm -hmm. Two, use eight to 10 weeks as your goalpost. So after eight weeks of something uh, in the store, we should start paying attention to the sell-through rate. If after eight weeks, we're at a 30% sell-through rate, that's a flag, right? So we're using 10 weeks, eight to, depending on what type of business, eight to 10 weeks as a goalpost of when should I start thinking about flagging stuff for markdown? Your first markdown is your cheapest. This is my favorite one. My I, I, my, I come from a long history of retailers. My grandfather used to tell me this. This is my favorite thing he taught me. No one wants to see the slow death of a piece of merchandise, right? We don't want to see something get marked down to 10% and then 15% and then 20% and then 30% and then 50% and then the other. stickers and then it's on a <laughs> clearance rack. That's like the slow march. It's, it's like cruelty, right? Sometimes we just got to say, you didn't work. You did your best. We got to send you back, right? We got to set, set you free out to the world. So being a little bit aggressive with markdowns, you know, starting at maybe 30%, you know, giving that some time, you know, sending it to 50% and, and really just making some harder decision because 10% is not a markdown. 10% is giving your email at the register, right? It's a it's a, a nice perk. It's not a markdown. Learn from every markdown. Actually, no. Why did I mark this down? Was it the color? Was it the fit? Was it the brand? Was it the wrong style? Did my customer just not like uh, this item? You know, I'll give you a, a, for instance, one of the things that I had to learn the hard way I took over buying responsibilities for the women's division and the business I was working in. And I went and I bought a lot of tops that were, uh, had a higher hem. And people said to me, women don't wear tops with higher hems because, you know, they may be a little bit conscious about their image, right? So a, a woman wants something with a more flattering hem. So I had to mark down a lot of tops. Do you think I went back into market the next season and bought high hem tops? No, I looked for tops that were more appropriate because I learned my lesson. If you keep buying into mistakes, you will keep having markdowns. And then think of it as paying tuition. 
It's your paying tuition for understanding your customers. So markdowns are a real expense, but they're a real expense into learning your customer. And so the next time you go to market, you're going to buy a little better. You're going to buy a little smarter, and it's going to help you in the long run. Merchandise should not have birthdays. Never. We're not doing birthday parties unless you're a quilt store that has maybe some fabric that is perennial. Uh, we really don't want to have birthdays. And I'm going to leave you with this, and then I will take questions. And Patrick, thank you for allowing me to go over. Well, I just want to no. one story that I really love, and it's a little cheesy, but it's close to my heart. Um, when JFK visited NASA, uh, and it was around the time that there was the space race, right? And he visited the NASA plant and everyone was hard at work and running around trying to get the last minute adjustments made because they were putting, you know, they were sending, this was the big one, this was the Apollo missions. And he said to the one of the, the gentlemen that was mopping the floor and he said, hey, and what do you do for NASA? And you know what that man responded? This is a, you know, urban legend, but he said, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And that sense of mission is the same type of passion that independent retailers need to bring to this space, right? You're going to do so many things as an independent retailer. And I've been there. Um, I was a, a business owner as well. And I know what that is like. The toilet breaks in the, in the uh, customer bathroom. Who do you think's fixing it? The AC is down. The, the register won't connect to the internet. Your goods are late. There is so many things that are on your plate as an independent retailer. But there has to be a larger sense of mission of what we're trying to do. And you are a pillar of your community. You are a trendsetter in the community, both in the fashion that people are wearing, the goods that people are buying, the home goods, the pet stores, you are enmeshed in the fabric of your community. And so there is a larger mission here. And again, it all starts with creating financial health for yourself and your business and your employees. And then we can spread that wealth around. So I hope we learned a little bit of something today. Uh, thank you for letting me get th through that. And Patrick, thank you for that. Uh, Keystone is tombstone. I'm going hey. to... If I can provide you with one nugget, I mean, I, heck, I, I did my job. You, <laughs> um, I always, in all, I've seen you speak at different conferences, and I am always taking away different things of you know pricing and margins, um, how to put out inventory. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I, I love learning about uh, just how to run a business better and how to have that. So, um, thank you very much. We had a couple, let's see, um, Cheryl said thank you and lots of information. So um, thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, if you have other questions, we have a couple minutes here. Uh, yeah. Dane, if you want to just tell people how they can contact you or how they can get a hold of Management One and, and learn more about, about Management One. Uh, well, you could go to management dash one o n e dot com and i'm going to put my email right in the chat if that works yeah absolutely uh make sure let's see you can probably change it to everyone otherwise i think the default is just to you and i and that doesn't do any good so oh you're right yeah. well it's dane d-a-n-e at management dash one and patrick you know i'm sure they could just get in contact with you and you could pass them along yeah, to me but sure. absolutely um all right. Well, it was yeah. so good being with you, Patrick. Oh, wait. see yep. you all in a month in Orlando. Yes. Will you be in Orlando? I'm going to be in Orlando. Are you going to be in Orlando? All right. Uh -oh. There we go. Well, whoever saw this presentation, you're seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, again, probably could pick Sorry, up. Sorry, more... Cheryl. I'll make it. I'll, I'll try to make it a little more interesting in Orlando. Cheryl, make we'll, sure to we'll come say hi. First off, Dane, thank you so much for being here. Again, amazing. There's so much great information. You guys do every retailer I talk to that is just like, yeah, things were going. And then I started working with Management One and I, I've just gotten such a better idea of how to run my business, how to price things. Um, so I know you guys are doing some incredible work and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, again, everybody, thank you so much, Dane. Again, thank you again for being here today. Um, and we will see you all next time. Let's put a man on the moon. Let's put a man on the moon. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or Mars. How about that? <laughs> or, or let's just uh, get, get some more cash in our retail. Let's, let's make some money.
Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good Take to care, see you. Everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you.